Oh, we're continuing the gospel of Mark. Um, let me pray for this word. I, um, Lord, we thank you, Father. We praise you. We're so, so grateful for this time together. It is truly, truly a blessing. I've, oh, I've got some, such wonderful news. Uh, hmm. A spiritual son of mine that's here today and to share that they're engaged. And, and they are. I love to see... Lord, thank you for young couples who operate in integrity. And I am. I'm so, so proud of them, Lord. And I thank you, Father God, for, for, for making this a church that focuses on, on marriage. Yes. Hmm. I thank you for calling me to a ministry of, of raising up men, Hallelujah. godly leaders to lead their family as a God-ordained, gender-assigned head of their family. So what a blessing, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for this message. I pray that the only words spoken are the words that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, allows me to speak. I pray for hearts that are willing to receive. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want to share a story with you real quick. If you guys remember, and we probably all remember, but there was a famous actor and a comedian and what they called an alley cat, W.C. Fields. If you guys remember who W.C. Fields was. Um, and, and he was not really a, a good guy, um, maybe an atheist or an agnostic or just like they called him an alley cat. And I think that was a kind word. And there's a story that says on his deathbed that a friend of his went to visit him. And, and he walks in and he sees him reading the Bible. And his friend is shocked. We probably got friends like that, if I'll be honest with you. And, 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 and he's on the deathbed reading the Bible. And his friend's like, oh, my goodness. You're reading the Bible. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm looking for loopholes. What I want to tell you is there are no loopholes. The one thing that the Lord put on my heart is that God's truth is the simple way. Remember, in the Greek, way is hodos, the way, the path. God's truth is the simple way to the straight path to living a blessed life. Amen. I got a call this morning about a, about a brother, and once again, a calamity had struck, and, and I'm like, why always that? The Lord's like, he's not on the path. What do you expect when you step off the path? This is why it's important to you. You see, we try to tend to, to negotiate alternative paths in life. Maybe sometimes the easy path, but there's only one way to God, the Father. The wisest, most educated religious leaders at the time that we're going to learn were sent to attack God's word to discredit God's son, Jesus. And they all failed. You will also find when you choose to live your life looking for loopholes, you'll also fail. So I want us to stand as the body. Let's read the word in our anchor scripture, the word that does not fail, does not fail you. So let's read this together. And this is from Mark 12, 35, 44. Jesus, when can David, uh, Jesus how can David call us a sin at Lord? Let's read. Then Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. That is a good word. Now we're going to teach through 1235-44. I just wanted to take this snippet. This is where we're going to start. So I want to encourage you, church, make what you say matter. Come on. I will share with you a couple years ago. I, I like, I'm from South Louisiana, and, I, and I liked, I'm a storyteller, and I think that was a success. I worked 12 years undercover, and uh, you had to be a good storyteller. You had to be able to spin a good tale to get yourself into a situation and mostly out of danger. And, and the Lord said, hey, you know what? I want to deliver you from that. So he put on my heart a one-word ministry. And the word was shalom, peace, the Hebrew. And he said, I simply want to show you the manifestation of my kratos power, my outward demonstrable power with one word. And what he was showing me is that in my ministry, I could do more by saying less. Jesus is going to give us the same example right now. You see, in this brief encounter with Jesus, he actually quotes scripture he silences the critics, and he satisfies the crowds. Mark 12, 35, then Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple. 
Now remember, as you're reading the scripture, look at it as an investigator. Don't just skip through to get to the sections you've heard about or you remember from kids' school. Read every word because every word matters. You see, before Jesus came to capture the crowd by teaching in the temple, he had to move through different phases, different seasons. Remember when he showed up in Bethany? He didn't just walk into the temple and begin teaching. I want to share, this is the same thing in our lives. We go through different seasons. And there's, there's three primary steps that I want to share with Jesus. And I want to share, I know they're going to resonate with you. But this first phase, this first step, it's God gives us these glimpses of brilliance. You see, after Jesus arrived on Palm Sunday on the back of the coat to the cheering crowds, he actually, he went to the temple. He looked around. He said nothing And simply went home. See, God gave him a glimpse of the next season assignment. How often do we get a clear call from Lord? Or a prophetic word from a prophet? And it lights our fire and we're ready to rock and roll into some ministry. And then it's crickets. It's crickets. I've known people that have waited 40 years. And I will tell you that it's not punishment, it's preparation. We're an equipping church. We're in Ephesians 4, 11, 12. Five-fold ministry church. Our job is to equip. My job is to equip you. This is what I call spiritual recon. You are called to be kingdom warriors. Good warriors do not run blind into battle. They operate on intelligence gained through equipping through research and recon. Recon, surveillance, it allows you to see the environment without having to encounter the obstacles or the opposition just yet. You see, during this time of recon, this is where a lot of believers make a decision whether or not they're going to continue to walk this out in faith. See, God, the example I want to share with you is God promises people a land flowing with milk and honey where their homes and their lands had already been established by the enemy. All they had to do was say yes. All they had to do was say yes. What I want to ask you is, I know the Lord's put a call on everybody's life. Will you say yes? Let me tell you what it looks like from a practical point of view. From take a look to kingdom recon. We're going to jump to Numbers 13, 1, 2. The Lord now said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Israelites. This is God saying, I need an assignment. I need a recon team to go out. And I need you to look at the land that I'm giving you. That's pretty clear. You see, God's going to allow you to scout your next season so that you know what to expect and what to encounter. God's not going to equip you with spiritual armor and just kick you out of the Humvee into hostile territory. God wants you equipped. He doesn't want you stumbling and bumbling. Like I said, you're not a toddler at your birthday party. Popping balloons or scaring you. You're gasping at gifts. We're to be mature. We're to stand firm. We're to be equipped. We are to conquer territory for the kingdom. But we can't if we can't find our way around the good word. He equips you fully so you're fully equipped. And that goes for everybody. No matter your age. Now, let's go to, let's keep it down. Numbers 13, 17, 18. And I will encourage you to read Numbers 13 and 14 this week. Moses gave the men these instructions. So as he sent them out to explore the land, go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak or many or few. He sent out spies. But like I said, they weren't just tossed out of the van into a hostile land. They were given instruction. They were being equipped. Just like you're being equipped. Just like you're being equipped. What I will tell you is Moses is also, he's exercising healthy stewardship. You see, he wants to know what's out there. So he can know how to be prepared to occupy it and care for it. 
You see, we all get wrapped up. Oh, we're more than conquerors. We're more than conquerors. Hallelujah, we're more than conquerors. Do you know what's more than a conqueror? An occupier. You've got to be prepared to steward well the land, the opportunity, the ministry, the prophetic word that God has moved you into. More than a conqueror is an occupier. Moses was told they were going to be conquerors. Now he wants to be a good occupier. I will give you an example, and I probably worn it out, but I, but I don't care. God, if God told you he'd give you a million dollars, and I'm going to be, hey, men, God's going to bless you with a million dollars. Have you contacted a CPA? Have you opened a money portfolio or a bank account? Maybe prepare to trust. At the basics, have you even taken a class on money management? I mean, if you believe, if you believe that the Lord told you, and he's good to his word, that he's going to give you a million dollars. Now, if you don't believe it, don't waste your time. You're not going to get it. But if you believe that the Lord told you he's got a million dollars to bless you, have you begun to prepare your nets to receive that goodness? It could be a million dollars. It could be a new spouse or a spouse. It could be a new marriage. It could be a new job or an assignment. But I love to give the example about the million dollars. And then I love to ask those folks, and they're, and they're like, well, good, good. And you're preparing your nets to be a good steward, a healthy steward. Have you, have you calculated what 10% tithe on a million dollars is? You know what the reaction I get? Huh. Oh, no, Mesha. That's South Louisiana Cajun, Mesha. Oh, Mesha, that's my money. Oh. Mm. You see, this is where God pumps the brakes on those blessings. If you've not prepared to honor God through healthy stewardship, he's going to delay the delivery of that promise. Whether it's ministry, if you've not developed the character to carry the calling, God's going to pump the brakes to protect you, not to punish you. And you say, oh, I don't know about this, God. You don't believe me? Good. Do you believe the word of the Lord? You see, the Israelites, for 40 years, they wandered around the wilderness until they were prepared to properly receive and steward God's blessings. You're like, really? Yeah. You see that walk from where they were to where the Lord called them to be? You know how many days that, that is? If you and I got out there today, it is 11 days. Their disobedience and their season of preparation kept them walking for 14,600 days of circling that mountain. For 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. Not as punishment, but as protection for preparation of God's provision. Church, I say, do not wait 40 years. Simply say yes and trust the Lord. I want to challenge you. What are you going to say about your own recon report when God gives you a glimpse of brilliance into the next season of your life? Let's go to Numbers 13, 31, 32. But the other men who had explored the land, so they sent out the 12 spies, and they came back to give a report. But the other men who had explored the land with them disagreed. We can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So, so, they, say, uh, so they spread this bad report about the land amongst the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored, it'll devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. How are you going to respond to God moving you into your next season in life? Like, oh, I can't quit my job to serve the Lord. How am I going to make it? Oh, I don't have time to lead that ministry in church. Somebody else is going to do it. Y'all know I ain't qualified to teach no Bible study. They gonna think I'm dumb. How do you receive your report when God gives you a glimpse into your next season? I will tell you that mostly nothing changes. Numbers 13, 33. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Enoch. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. I want to ask you, you ever wonder, how did the spies know 
what these people thought. How did they know that they thought that they were like grasshoppers too? You see, they opened their minds and fear invaded their minds. They created a, an opening, a portal, a door, and fear invaded their mind. You know what they did? They created a false narrative about the people that they never knew and they never spoke to. You see, I think we do that sometimes when God calls us to minister to certain people. Or maybe people in the church. We look at each other and like, well, they don't like me. How do you know? I don't know, but I ain't going to talk to them. If the Lord has called you to minister to or share a word with, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to choose like Caleb. You see, you got the free will to choose. I ask you to choose wisely. You see, Caleb was one of those spies. Number 1330, Numbers 1330. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once to take the land. We can certainly conquer it. I want to ask you, when it comes to God giving glimpses, what's your mindset going to be? Are you going to trust in the Lord? Let's do it. Let's go conquer that land. Are you going to talk yourself out of God's blessings? Step two, when God calls you into the next season, clean your temple. Come on. Clean your temple. If you recall, after Palm Sunday, John 2, 15, 16 tells us, Jesus returned to clear the temple of the corrupted money changers and the sin that was going on in his father's house. You see, before God allows breakthrough, he's going to make sure that you're, you're ready to carry the weight of the next season. I just ask you, it's about character building. Do you have the character to carry God's calling? Have you prepared your nets to receive the goodness that's God's? I will tell you, if not, it will crush you. The folks in our healthy stewardship class, I've shared it before, 73% of all people who have won multi-million dollar lotteries and Powerball, 73% of multi-millionaires overnight within three years filed bankruptcy. Did they have the character to carry that? Not at all. That's just money. We are talking about and a call and anointing from the Lord placed on your life. If you don't think there's gravity that comes with a call and, a, and an appointing from the Lord, you're mistaken. You've got to increase your tensile strength. It starts with clean, cleansing your temple. What in your temple needs to be cleansed? I will challenge you to ask the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit and he will reveal it to you. The third is step boldly into your assignment, fully equipped. You see, now we see Jesus stand firm against the relentless attacks of the enemy. We've had the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the, and the Herodians, the Sanhedrin council, and now we got the scribes, and they've all come to attack him, and they all failed. I ask you, who's coming against you? Who's coming against you? You know what? It doesn't matter. Stand, stand, withstand the wiles of the enemy that Paul, that he tells us in Ephesians. So now it's Jesus' turn. So Jesus says in Mark 12, 35, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Like Jesus is not doing what they did to him. He's not concocting some wild scenario about uh, seven brothers for a bride and, and marriage and, and the resurrection. Jesus is simply asking a straightforward question grounded in Scripture. You see, Scripture is not meant to confuse or confound or bring chaos. If somebody's whipping the word of the Lord with, a, with an unrighteous sword and it's bringing confusion and chaos, that ain't a word from the Lord. It'll bring conviction and correction, but it's grounded in Scripture. So let me ask you a question. Jesus asked the question. So as an investigator, you should say, well, I don't know. Do they actually say, do the religious elites actually say that, that Christ is the son of David? Well, let me, go, let me go to the book. Matthew 22, 41, 42. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what do you think about the Christ? Like, whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. So there you go. 
There you go. But let me tell you, this is the real issue. This is the real issue. What I encourage you in, this, in, this, in these perilous times that is, our, that is our world, be careful of the distractions over here to keep your eye on the cross over here. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of static out in the atmosphere. But let me tell you that the cross of Christ don't move. Keep your eyes on the real issue. You see, the issue with these guys, it's not whether the Christ is the son of David, but it's, it's Jesus the Christ. You see, Jesus had all, through his ministry, he had withheld his identity. After a miracle, what did he tell people? Hey, y'all don't say nothing to nobody. Now, did that stop people? No. It shouldn't stop us either from proclaiming the goodness of God. But now, things have shifted. He's not holding them back. So Jesus asked, how is it that the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said, by the Holy Spirit, by the revelation and impartation of the Holy Spirit, told David, and he's going to, in this he's going to quote Psalms 110.1, The Lord said to my God, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? You see, at this point, David's speaking prophetically. And what I want to share with you is when you look in Scripture, if you go back, you see the first word, the first usage of the word Lord. Do you see something different in that spelling of Lord than the second use of Lord? What do you see? It's all caps. That signifies, and he's talking about God, he's talking about Yahweh. When he, when he refers to uppercase L, lowercase O R D, he's referring to the Messiah. To the Christ. I want you to see that distinction so you understand the distinction in that, in that quote. David says, my Lord. What he's saying is, my Messiah, my Christ is Lord. And so when you see what the scripture says, it says that the Messiah, the Christ, will come from where? The seed of David. So just remember as you're reading, as you're, as you're investigating the word of the Lord, when you see the all caps, that is a reference to Yahweh. So, big question. Well, how could Jesus be David's son if David also calls his son Lord? I mean, that's a, that's a legitimate question. So let's go to 2 Samuel 7, 12, 16. This is where it establishes that the Christ, the Messiah, will come from the seed of David. 2 Samuel, for when you die, and this is Nathan who's talking to David on his deathbed, okay? For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name. And I will secure his royal throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. And if he sins, I will correct and discipline him with the rod, like any father would do. But my favor will not be taken from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from your sight. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time, and your throne will be secure forever. So when, when 2 Samuel, this is, this is a prophetic word. Now in this word, there's two contexts. There's an immediate context, which is he's telling David that he's going to replace him as king with Solomon, his son. And then there's the messianic context. This is the interpretation of, of different texts and prophecies or events that are relating to the Messiah. So as King David's dying, so God, through the Nathan, through the prophet Nathan, tells him, 2 Samuel 7, 12, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed, your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, the seed from your body, it applies to who? To Solomon in the natural, and Jesus is the seed, but in the supernatural. So I want you to understand the immediate context and the messianic context of that, of that word. But we're going to focus on Jesus, okay? 
You will know, you know Solomon, you will also see the parallels. But let's focus on Jesus. Uh, 2 Samuel 7, 13. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. You see, that's Jesus' temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? So Nathan's prophetic declaration continues to David in uh, 2 Samuel 7, 12. It says, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Now we know Solomon was not going to live forever. But the kingdom of God, yes. So you should be asking, well, does David's house like actually lead to Jesus? Well, I always encourage you when you're reading, especially the New Testament, Matt, the Gospels, don't skip over those genealogies. Amen. You know, I've shared before that, that our, our son Graham, when he was the youngest, and every night before supper, we'd read Old Testament, New Testament, um, Psalms, Proverbs. And Graham would always want to read. He'd go, I want the hard names, which is great for encouraging young believers. Not so great when you've got some delicious food that's, that's getting cold. But you know what? You don't skip over the genealogy. Amen. Why? Because if you go to Matthew 1, and you read the genealogical proof that will show you that Jesus is a direct descendant of Abraham and David through Joseph, Jesus' legal father. You see, in Israel, the, the line of the king, it had to come through the father's lineage. And although Jesus was not Joseph's biological son, Joseph's line to King David gave Jesus the natural right of royalty. God the Father gave Jesus the supernatural right of eternal king. So he said, well, what about Mary? Go to Luke 3. Read the genealogy as listed in Luke 3. Do you know where, do you know where Mary's lineage leads to? King David. Like, should anybody be surprised that God in his working all things for good has, has established this? Even for the naysayers, thousands of years later, so we learn, we learn that, that that's a good answer. Like scripture confirms that the Christ will come through the seed of David. There should be no debate, no argument. Not our opinion, but God's word. So we still have that, that outlier, right? Because this is the issue. Not, not, as, not as, uh, as Christ the seed of David, but is Jesus the Christ. Well, let's look at Romans 1, 2, 4. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. In this earthly life, he was born into King David's family line. And he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ. Our Lord. If that doesn't settle any argument, I don't ever know what will. I don't ever know what will. So we ask, well, well, why didn't they see it? They knew the law better than anybody, these religious elites. We ask the same question. Why don't the people in our lives see the goodness of God? Why are they so against God? Why are they so against us? You see, their hatred of Jesus and their love of worldly positions of wealth and influence, it blinded them from, from seeing clearly that Jesus was the Christ. I will challenge you to have compassion over people, even those who persecute you, even those who reject you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the truth of the word of the Lord. This is where the heart of compassion. If you share gospel with somebody and you don't get the reaction that you thought you wanted. And it discourages you from doing it. Then, then what I would challenge is that was a performance based delivery. You were expecting something from them. All God expects from you is to deliver that word. Have no expectation. Empty yourself 
of expectation. You know, I've shared before and I'm going to continue to share. When, when in my SWAT unit for 12 years, I was a, uh, I was a SWAT commander in 16 years special operations undercover and, and, and uh, 16 years SWAT, I'm sorry, 12 years undercover. And, and we, we adopted the motto, if not us, who? If not us, who? If they called us into that situation and we could not resolve that situation, there was nobody coming. There was nobody coming to help. So we made sure that we were equipped, that we were armed, that we were prepared. If you don't share the gospel with a lost and dying world, who will? There's not a B team. There's not a B team. There's nobody else coming to share the gospel with this world. We were sent. We're being, we're being equipped. We're being apostolo. We're being apostolically sent to go forward to share the good word of the gospel. Because there are Pharisees and Sadducees and Herodians and scribes and Sanhedrin councils who get together at the workplace and don't want you to sit at their table. And they're ripping you. And they're trying to find the loopholes and an impenetrable gospel. And there's none. But when you keep sharing that word and they come to that understanding, there's no other way but the way, the hodos, the truth, the way, the path. Then they become receptive. You see, even a blind man could see that Jesus was the son of David. Mark 10, 47, Bartimaeus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Even a mother in distress over her demon-possessed daughter knew it too. Matthew 15, 22. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Why did these people come to this point, to the realization that Jesus is the son of David? Because their vessels were finally yielded and willing to receive the truth of the word. Jesus affirms that he is both the natural son of David and the supernatural son of God. Let's go to Revelation 22.6. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. The bright and morning star. I will affirm to you that Jesus is both the creator of David and the descendant of David. Only, only, only the Son of God made flesh could say that. So we'll continue through this, this gospel. You must follow God's word and not man's influence. Mark 12, 37, and the common people heard him gladly. The common people. Do y'all remember the word aklos? We've used it a lot of times through the gospel of Mark. The aklos, it's the Greek for a confused multitude, a confused crowd. This, they use, they go back to the Greek aklos. These are... 250,000 people in, in, in the city for the Passover. Now, not all 250 are there, but I can guarantee you there's a lot of people there. The Greek specifically uses the word aklos, a confused multitude. Let me remind you on Palm Sunday, remember? Remember when he came in on the back of the coat, on the donkey? And they were praising him and throwing their garments before him. Never once in the Greek or Hebrew did it use the word aklos. They were not confused on that Sunday. Why were they in clarity? Because they were singularly focused on the Christ. When you take your eyes off of Jesus, you fall into the, the horde of the aklos. You see, they're confused again. Why are they confused again? Because what have they seen the whole day? They've seen the influencers. Like these cats that were coming against you, they would be like your, your people with a million plus followers on TikTok and Instagram. These are your social influencers. 
These are the people who sway society's opinion. And all the, the crowd who were not confused, after a full day of this stuff, they're back where? They're back confused. Because they're listening to the social influencers instead of clinging to the eternal word of God. I do caution you again. I caution you again. As, as the society continues, we move. Listen, let me tell you, things are not going to get better. For New Jerusalem to come down, for these things to pass away, we're going to continue, as Paul tells us, into perilous times. We've got to raise up to be godly leaders in ungodly times. Or we're going to find ourselves victimized, oclose by these social influencers. Read your word, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. Who are establishing the patterns of this world right now? These social influencers. These political influencers. These corrupted influencers. Do, if we could, we're not going to change the word of the Lord. If we could make Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to what the social influencers are feeding you. Renew your mind by the reading of the word. You see, I want to tell you that these people that were, that were praising Jesus on that Sunday, you know what, in a couple days, they're going to be screaming, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. I'll continue when it says, oh, the crowd heard. The Greek is a kuo. What that means is to take in, to admit to mental acceptance. What they're doing is they were confused, but they akuo. What they're doing is mental acceptance. They're doing what with their mind? They're renewing their mind. See, the crowd is transitioning from being aklos through their akuo, their mental acceptance. They're having their minds renewed. By what? By the scripture that Jesus is using. Not by your force of personality. Or by your argumentative skills. And I'll remind you, it's not a spiritual gift. Argumenting but by the word of the Lord. Amen. And it says, and they heard gladly. Gladly. In the Greek, it's hedios, with pleasure, willingly. And I want to ask you, does hedios, it's the Greek word for hedonist, for hedonism. What I will tell you, that, that so we understand hedonism as it's used in the Greek, is that it just means seeking immediate gratification and sensory pleasures often at the expense of long-term well-being of themselves or others. You see, they're having their minds renewed. They're confused. They receive. They renew their mind. But they receive it gladly. It's like that, the parable of the seeds on shallow soil. Oh, amen. Thank you, Jesus. I love that word on Sunday. And then the, it gets picked up. It gets snuffed out. Because now they're back to receiving it in a hedonistic way. Because it's easy. What I will tell you, understanding that this is how society works. This is how people operate. They're easily swayed. They're double-minded. You've got to anchor yourself in the Word yeah. every day. Amen. When you look at this crowd of people, are you surprised after the verbal attacks on Jesus escalated? Well, are you going to be surprised that the escalation of verbal attacks leads to a physical act and a killing of Jesus? People then, people now are absolutely lost without Jesus. So now we see Jesus rebuke these Pharisees. He had exposed their hypocrisy. And he tried to renew the minds of the crowd with Scripture. But now he rebukes the scribes. We'll wrap it. Mark 12, and Kurt, if you want to start making your way up, 12, 38, 40, beware of the scribes. Then he said to them in his teaching, beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplace, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feast, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. You see, Jesus rebukes the scribes because their behavior is contrary to the values that Jesus is teaching, to the scriptures of the Lord. 
He rebukes them as, as a call to true righteousness and integrity. Jesus is not going to give up on anybody. Anybody. Even hung on that tree. He does not give up on anybody. I've shared before the thief. Can you imagine when he says, you'll be with me this day in paradise? And he gets to heaven and they're like, what you doing here? What's your denomination? What's your attendance record? Did you go through a five-step program to become a new member? No. I can just imagine asking a thief, then what are you doing here? That guy, the guy on the middle cross, he said, I could come. He said, I could come. Jesus is not going to give up on anybody. Church, do not give up on anybody. But you see, Jesus gave them the consequences for their rebellious behavior. Yet they rejected him again. Family, you all get free will. You have the choice to choose. All I'm going to ask you is to choose wisely. Choose wisely. So one last lesson in this chapter 12. From Mark 12, 31, 44, the widow's two mites. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which makes a quadrant. So he, he called the disciples to himself, and he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who has given money to the treasury. For, for they all put out of their abundance. But she put out of her poverty. She put in all that she had. Her whole livelihood. Now what I want to share. I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to stop right here. I want to share with you. That the Lord has given me a, an assignment. He's asked me to, to bring a message to this church over the next four weeks. It's an urgent message. It's an important message because it's from the Lord. I'm going to pick back up next week at the story of the widow's two mites because I want to share with you how in her obedience she helped launch a revolution. I'm going to ask you, and then I'll pray us out. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to make a dramatic effect. I'm not that smart. I'm simply making sure that everything I share with you comes from the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to ask you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in my third week of fasting a water fast. And it was through that fasting the Lord sent me into that, that he gave me this revelation so I don't take it lightly. What I'm going to ask you, church, is to come together as the body. And I'm not breaking bad news. There's no big curtain call. This is good stuff. I'm just asking you. We've been equipping, equipping, equipping through the gospel. I'm going to ask you, if you would, this week, whatever your level of commitment to join me in continuing to fast, continuing to pray for this word that the Lord's going to reveal. I will tell you that this word, that this four-week series, this teaching, is for you. It's for you. I have been, I've been grieving. I've been grieving every morning in my closet. Literally in the closet. The Lord wants to bless you so abundantly. Amen. I will tell you that he did not call you to this church for nothing. 
I, did, I will tell you that he did not call you to this church because there may have been dissatisfaction at your other church. Because if that's the only reason you're here, you'll get dissatisfied, dissatisfied with this church and you're going to go to another church. The Lord has called you here for a special season. Amen. The Lord has called you here for a special time. And I believe that this message that the Lord has for you, this teaching, straight scripture, I'm going to read more scripture. I may even need to get an elder to help me read scripture for the next four weeks because I'm going to share with you God's word. This is a word, a series that will change your life. And I don't say it lightly. I have had my life transformed from being the chief of sinners to absolutely yielded and throwing my flesh on the altar of God's consuming fire. I ask you to pray. I ask you to pray. And to commit this week to whatever level of fasting that the Holy Spirit puts on your heart. But pray for this word. So if we can stand as the body and, and I'll close this out. And church, I don't want you to go away thinking, well, that's a cliffhanger. I sure didn't expect that. It is good, good news. Yes, it Amen. Because it's a good word. Amen. I just ask you, let's come together as the body. Come together in the body and let's commit to a week of, of, of fasting and prayer with an expectation of a holy impartation from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Questions in your life that you have dealt with over weeks and maybe months, the Lord will give you confirmation. So Lord, I praise you. We thank you, Lord. I pray for the families that are not here today. I pray covering over them. We are one body. So we pray for those who are, who are still ill and those who are, had to travel or obligations. Lord, I pray for the, for the family that's here today. I thank you, Lord, that this is not an oclos. This is an equip. This is an equip special forces operation of spiritual warriors. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone that has not received Jesus Christ as, your, as, your, as their Lord and Savior, I, I invite you to come up to make a public declaration of faith. If you're not comfortable with that, I respect that. After service, two of our elders will be up here to receive you. But do not walk out of this, out of this house without making that, that, comp, that acclam, uh, acclamation, proper, uh, that, that decision. So, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we, we're so grateful for these times. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the corporate fall of holy fire on this body. Lord, I thank you for the, <laughs> I thank you for the glimpse of the brilliance that this body's moving into. I thank you for the, for the glimpse of the next season. I pray that the body responds like Caleb. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's conquer that land. As we prepare to occupy it well. So Lord, I pray that, the, that through the Holy Spirit that you, you put a you put a word on everyone's heart, a conviction to, to dedicate time this week to come into to a time of fasting and prayer in anticipation of the encounter that is going to be received individually and corporately over these next four weeks. Lord, I pray a special blessing over this body. There are people that have served in military in this body. There are people that have served in, in, in the first responders community in this body. There are people who have stood on the front line of spiritual warfare in this body. And it is not easy. But Lord, I am thankful that this house is a place of refuge and rest and restoration and renewal and equipping to fight the good fight to conquer kingdom ground, to occupy well. Mm. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank Hallelujah. you. Thank you, Lord.